Hello, this is Fritze Says, and welcome back to One Last Night. I have been away from home for quite a while, so I haven't really been able to record um, or do these with any sort of consistency, so please forgive that. Um, but yeah, so where we last left off, Xavier had just fought in the arena and done a brutal fight with a Faded. Uh, he ended up being victorious, and we're now collecting him from the Brutal Wonderland stage. And we're going to talk with Treat and Shen and see what's going on. Let's go ahead and get started. I ducked back down, motioning for Treat and Shen to bring me back to our secluded corner we'd been in before where I took a seat on the bench. Go get Xavier, please. Without protest, the two went off to fetch the bat, and I took a breather from it all. It hadn't even been a full 24 hours since I'd been reunited with Alistair, and I still felt so overwhelmed by it all. With the insanity of Wonderland thrown into the mix, I was just glad my part in it was over. Xavier and I had lived to see another day, despite both of us being worse for wear. That's a simple fact I could at least focus on. Anything more than that at the moment was a bit too much for me. It didn't help that I was starting to think the double head trauma I'd received had given me a concussion. Eventually, the three limped back to our corner, towels in hand ready to wipe off the majority of the Faded's blood. I didn't even want to think about where that filthy cloth had come from. The crowd parted without a word from them, the display they had just witnessed only serving to provide more fear to our little party. Shen and Treat lowered Xavier onto the bench, the latter cringing a little as pressure was applied to his abdominal wound in the process. I wanted to rush over to fuss over him to try and treat his wounds, but I felt helpless without any of the supplies I usually had with me. I was almost panicking on what to do. Luckily, Treat stepped in instead. He immediately began assessing Xavier instead. Aside from the broken finger that's already been treated, there's the matter of his stomach wound and shoulder. Thankfully, the wound isn't deep, but I don't have anything sanitary to treat it with at the moment. The shoulder, however, is simply dislocated. I can pop it back into place, but it'll hurt. Shen, can you find him something for him to bite down on? I expected a tease from the hyena, but instead they set to the task immediately. How do you know how to pop it back in? Are you some kind of doctor? Treat laughed at that. Oh, the two of you really do have similar thoughts. I was the captain of my rugby team, so I took it upon myself to learn some basics of first aid and treatment of typical sports injuries. I've dislocated my own shoulder once or twice on the field. I placed my hand on Xavier's other shoulder and smiled at Treat, giving him a nod of approval. Don't worry, kid. You're in good hands. Treat returned my smile, appreciative of the trust I was showing him in this moment. I hadn't expected to find allies so fast, but they were exactly what I needed to help us get out of here. It felt natural to trust all three of my new friends. The moment was broken suddenly as voices called out from elsewhere in the room. Hey, give that back! Soon, handsome. I need it right now. But it's my lucky stick! They snorted. Who the fuck has a lucky stick? I do. 
Well, if it is so lucky, then it will come right back to you. There wasn't a response as Shen made their way back to our group, carrying the apparent lucky stick, a branch that was found who knows where or when. One bite down stick delivered fresh in 30 minutes or less. Treat shook his head with a smile as he gave Xavier the stick to bite down on. All right, you'll feel some sudden pain and be sore for a bit after. Xavier gave a laugh before flinching. Pretty sure I'll be sore elsewhere regardless. Fair point. Now I'll pop it back in on the count of three. Ready? Xavier placed the stick in his mouth and nodded. Three! Not wasting a second, he immediately pushed Xavier's shoulder up and back into place causing the bat to bite down hard on the stick and make a muffled noise of pain. Sorry. If I counted down, the anxiety would have built up, and it's often better to just skip it entirely. You okay? Xavier rolled his shoulder gently, testing it before he used the arm to take the stick out of his mouth. The soreness you mentioned is definitely there, but I can move it again, so I'd say that's a good sign. The wolverine went to give the bat a hearty pat on the back, but stopped himself after thinking about it. Right. So now that you two boys have been cleared by the school nurse, how about we get to answering some questions? Particularly you, Dorian. How do you end up dating a monster like that? I'm also curious. You said it before they separated us, and while I was waiting to fight, I was stuck thinking about it. I felt a little ganged up on, having all three of them questioning me on what was a very traumatic experience, and a bit difficult for me to discuss. I shifted nervously, unsure what to say. Before I knew it, Xavier slid his hand into mine subtly on the bench, and I felt myself comfortable a bit in that moment. He was always looking out for me. He deserved to hear the truth. Well, I'll start things out from the beginning, back when he and I had first met. Several years ago. While most people my age had gone away for college, a career set in their minds with their hearts ready to give it their all, I'd opted out of education for the time being. The fact was I didn't know what I wanted. Nothing had ever really truly stuck out to me. Life had failed to inspire me to become something, and nothing set me on that path for life. I was 19 and completely lost. Most of the friends I had in high school had moved away to follow those dreams that I'd lacked, leaving me behind with my minimal social skills to fend for myself. Those few that were left were too busy with their own education, leaving me to feel like the runt of the litter. As such, no matter how hard I tried, I couldn't help but feel that there was something wrong with me for being so different. Instead, I turned to work. I could grab with my high school diploma were minimum wage jobs, which I told myself would be valid work experience in the future. So after graduation, I turned to the workforce and saved while living with my parents. It cut my expenses down significantly, but resulted in cutting down my mental health as well. I was feeling like a burden. After a while, I tried to look for an apartment on my own, but living in the city was damn expensive. My only choice was to look for a roommate. It was luck that I had managed to find the perfect place for my first try. My own bedroom, low rent, and a guy a few years older than me in need of someone to fill that spot. I sent in my application and was almost immediately accepted, not long after I packed my things and moved in.
I was nervous, rooming with a stranger. My social anxiety wasn't a help in these si kinds of situations, but over time I warmed up to him. His name was Will. He was a fox, tall and slender, with some muscle on him. Quite the ladies' man, considering the amount of women he dated in the time we lived together. He was also quite accepting of the fact that I was gay. I started living with felt like a fresh start with a new friend. It didn't quell all the voices that shouted in my head, but to help quiet them a bit. Look, I hate to interrupt a good story. Good? Ow! But can we get to the part about Alistair, please? Right, sorry. Will was tired of seeing how lonely I was and kept insisting I try to find a boyfriend to help with it. He tried to set me up a few times, but I was always reluctant. Eventually, he decided to invite me to a bar with a couple of his buddies, one of whom worked there. I accepted, and upon arrival was when I met him. Alistair. I wasn't sure what drew me to him out of all of Will's friends, but there was a charm I couldn't ignore. He seemed to have that same charisma as Will, but amplified to the point where you couldn't take your eyes off him. I guess that's what got him started as a bartender, that magnetic pull. The owner clearly knew the lion would be great for business. While we were there, I watched how he interacted with everyone. The lion was friendly, social, and polite. But his attitude towards me was something else. Something different. He drew out a part of me I never knew existed. We talked more and more as the night wore on, and I could tell he felt the pull towards me just as I felt towards him. The sparks were flying, and all of our friends around us knew it. We were so engrossed in the conversation, we hadn't noticed our friends leave, only drawn back to reality when an alarm on his phone went off signaling the end of his shift. He suggested we take the conversation back to his place, and I happily obliged. He asked me out a week later, and I instantly said yes. From there, our relationship took flight. We fell for each other hard, becoming practically inseparable. We spent most of our free time together and constantly visited each other at work. It was something completely unfamiliar to me, that level of dedication. It all felt like a dream, yet also like I was waking up and seeing the world for the first time. Our relationship changed me on a fundamental level. I was an introvert and he was an extrovert, but our time together brought out parts of me I didn't know I had hidden. He taught me that, though the world was cruel, I shouldn't be afraid of it. I learned how to act confident by being myself, to socialize, even to love and be loved in that way. My whole perspective was changed by Alistair. Which is why it's so shocking to see him the way he is now. Back then, he was caring, kind, affectionate, and sweet. He stuck his neck out for anybody and everyone and was more than willing to go out of his way if it meant he could help someone. He did volunteer work at the orphanage he was raised at, as well as donated money to them on a monthly basis. He took me on a few dates where we helped out at a soup kitchen. It wasn't quite what I had expected, but any time spent with him was time I enjoyed. He also treated me like a king when we started out, he spoiled me with gifts and quality time and so much affection. I could tell he was a truly kind soul. After a year, we moved in together. We were confident that things between us could last forever. Then it all changed. A few months after my birthday, and after dating for Baylory over a year and a half, I got a phone call from emergency services. They'd found my parents dead in a car wreck. 
It was a horrible accident and there were no survivors from either party. I was devastated. I turned to Alistair to comfort me, to be my rock, and he was for a little while, but eventually things seemed to change. It was as though he was more preoccupied, working more often and spending less and less time with me despite living together. His comfort words were repetitive and hollow, as though he'd lost interest. Slowly but surely, a gap began to grow between us. I no longer knew what to do. That same hollow feeling of loneliness that I hadn't felt since before we first met had begun creeping back into my life, and it scared me. I didn't know how to approach him about it. As the days ticked closer and closer to our two-year anniversary, everything seemed to go to shit. I'd been out all day with Will, who had patiently listened to my worries and made efforts to cheer me up. When I arrived back at our place, it was late, and I'd avoided denouncing myself, not wanting to risk waking Alistair if he had been asleep. I was tired myself and knew that he'd always gave the best cuddles when sleepy. It was something I could use at the moment. I took off my shoes and wandered to the kitchen for a glass of water when I heard it. The sounds coming from the bedroom. Not wanting to think the worst, I'd assume maybe he was watching porn. Or our sex life hadn't been great recently, and it made sense if he was trying to get himself off. I walked closer and closer to the door, trying to convince myself that everything was fine. My hand hovered above the knob, twitching from the building anxiety as I tried to gather the courage. I took one final deep breath and pushed open the door to find exactly what I wish I hadn't. There, bending over another man, was Alistair. They were parallel to the door, so I could see both of them in full view as they fucked. Both had frozen as I'd opened the door, and they stared at me in shocked surprise. I think Alistair must have called out to me at that moment, but my ears were dead to the world as I fled, my heart racing. I couldn't believe this sight before me. I couldn't help but wonder what I could have done better where had I gone wrong, and what had led things to the point where he'd cheat on me. All these thoughts echoed through my head as I fled into the night. The image burned behind my eyes. I'll stare naked with a man whose face I'd never forget. The one and only palace cat I've ever met, who stands up there now next to his master. The next day, I returned to find Alistair there waiting for me. I wandered the city all night before returning back to my ruined home. I screamed at Alistair, asking him how he could do this and why. I was pissed and hurt and full of negative emotions that I couldn't keep in anymore. If he had talked to me, I would have been fine opening up our, our relationship. I understand that sometimes you can't always fill a partner's needs completely. But the deceit, going behind my back to do it, it was that was a complete breach of trust I couldn't forgive. By the time I'd finished saying my piece, tears wetting my cheeks, I finally looked at him pr again properly, and his expression told me everything I needed to know. He looked indifferent, as though nothing I'd said had meant a thing to him, as though the past nearly two years of our lives were all for nothing. That look was more than I could handle. I walked away, grabbing what shit of mine I could quickly find, packing it up and calling Will in desperation. He was immediately sympathetic and let me stay for a little while. And as I left that apartment, the place I thought could have been my true home with the man I thought was my forever, I saw the look again on his face. That was the last time I ever saw Alistair until now.
There was a silence amongst us as I finished the story. Nobody quite sure how to respond to the situation. I just laid two major events from my life bare for the three of them to do with as they pleased, with a majority of one having to do with the person who was holding us all captive. Frankly, both things were trauma I hadn't wanted to relive, but were necessary in order for them to have a better picture in understanding our captor. I couldn't help myself worrying over what they would say, though. I knew I wasn't in the wrong for what happened, yet a part of me felt like I was even after all this time. He was and will always be my first love, someone who set my life on a new path I'm not sure I would ever have ventured on if I had never met him. He changed a lot of me for the better when we were together. I said I hated the lion, that I absolutely despised him for everything that transpired, which was mostly true. But I knew that a piece of my heart still belonged to him. And that part is what regretted not having heard him out most of all. There were still so many unanswered questions I had about everything, but I couldn't waste my time thinking about those right now. I brought my focus back to my three companions, the silence stretching further on until Shen eventually broke it. Well, shit. It wasn't the most elegant response, but one I take nonetheless. The other two seemed to relax at not having to be still or silent anymore thanks to the hyena. Almost immediately, I found myself wrapped in a double hug from both Xavier and Treat, in an effort for them to show their support for me in the scenario. I graciously accepted it and hugged them back, enjoying the infection. I realized now that a few stray tears had fallen down my face during the story that I took a second to wipe away. When the hug ended, me having to tap on Treat's shoulder to prevent him from squeezing us and our injuries too hard, there was still an awkward energy floating around the group. None of us knew what to say next. Hum. Shen seemed to be contemplating something as they looked me up and down. What is it? They sighed. It's not that I don't believe your story, because I do. But there's just one detail that I'm missing that I need to know. I'm not sure what I'd left out in the tale, but if it helps him trust me, I'm more than willing to give it. Ask away. They didn't miss a beat. How big is Alistair's dick? I blinked. Knowing I should have expected something like this from them. But still being caught off guard nonetheless. Treat immediately stood up and moved to smack Shen in the back of the head. La Hina dodged and began to use Xavier and I as a barrier as Treat chased them. I could almost hear the cartoon chase music start up. I found myself smiling at the antics. The tension from before dissipated. Somehow they'd known just what to say to get things back on track. Which meant it was my turn to respond, and two could play their game. Nine inches. All of them turned to me. What? Shen asked how big he was. That's the answer. Nine inches. Shen whistled. Damn, Dorian. Impressive. Well, I knew you could take it. I didn't realize just how much you had it in you. Who says it was just me? Their eyes widened before a laugh. All right. I respect it. Game recognizes game. They gave an approving nod, and I saw Xavier blushing a little. I couldn't help but to wink at him when we made eye contact and he blushed harder. I clapped my hands, eager to move on with the conversation now that the barrier of awkwardness had been overcome. Now with that out of the way, 
I believe there was an agreement the two of you would share more about yourselves. Indeed there was. It's only fair you get to ask whatever, given the significance of what you told us. As I was thinking it over, Xavier spoke up. I have one, if that's alright with you, Dorian. Be my guest. Well, it's not so much a question as more of a general thing to be curious about. But I'd like to hear more about your lives before the apocalypse. I think it's a good way to get to know each other better. Shen tensed at the proposal, Treat giving them a quick glance at the same moment. I can start us off with that, since we didn't really have proper introductions. I'll skip past the name part, since Shen already introduced me. I'd almost asked about it before remembering the earlier warning they'd given. I grew up here in the city, originally living on the east side before moving to the west when I was around eight or so. My childhood wasn't great, but I managed. I live with my mother, who was an extremely hardworking woman, who gave it her all to raise us as best she could as a single parent. It wasn't an easy task, but she made it work. Then there's my younger sister, Trixie. She's about two years younger and means the whole world to me. Life was difficult for us both growing up, but it strengthened our bond as siblings. I'll do anything for her. Hell. Before high school, I'd started working out to make sure I could protect her better, both her and my mom. Since our mom was busy working full-time, we dedicated ourselves to studying so she wouldn't worry about us in our future. At a young age, we both had the goal of getting to a place in life where we could support her like she did us. Eventually, when I'd entered high school, I was in great shape, with a studious and healthy mind. Classes were easy for me, and I was ready to learn something new, which is where rugby came into play. I joined our school's team in my second year, and by the third, I was the star player. I had a knack for strategy, and a build that was imposing to others my age. During the championship that year, Several scouts attended the match in order to seek me out for their universities. When the time came for my final year, I didn't even have to think of where to apply. Universities from across the country were hoping to have me go to their schools, offering full-time scholarships. It was all a dream come true for me. The only problem was that they were all so far away. In order to go, I'd have to leave my family behind. He closed his eyes and took a deep breath, letting it out in a sigh. I couldn't do that. I wanted to stay and protect them. Eventually, Gall Haven approached me. They offered me the same deal as many other places had, and it was a miracle that I got to stay so close to my family. I accepted their offer, took up a course in biochemistry while joining their rugby team, and the rest is history. In sync, Xavier and I gave nods and smiles of approval. It made sense why he'd lasted through the previous Wonderland now. He was strong, kind-hearted, and a protector. That combined with his intellect made him a more than worthy ally and commanded a lot of my respect. Voice whispered in the back of my mind, though, having listened carefully to his words. He talked about his sister in the present tense, but his mother in the past. Something had happened there. Instead of dragging the conversation down with what would have no doubt be a difficult topic, I turned my attention to Shen instead. What about you? What about me? 
I had grown quiet and tense during Shen's recount for reasons I wasn't sure why. Well, what's your story? It looked like they were about to snap. But Treat put a hand on their shoulder, and they took a deep breath. Avoiding our eyes, they spoke. There's nothing to tell, really. Average life, realized I was non-binary, came out and was accepted by most. That's it. Never went to college, and instead lived with a roommate straight out of high school. I waited for anything more than of an explanation, but none came. It was clear their past was something they weren't comfortable talking about. I wanted to try and ask more, to convince them to open up, but when Treat shot a quick glance towards Xavier and I and shook his head, though, I could tell that was all we'd get for now. I'll go next, then, if that's all right. Turning, I looked at him in surprise. Are you sure? He gave me an understanding nod and whispered to me. It might make Shen more willing to open up if I do. I might be able to empathize. I smiled, happy that his kind-heartedness remained at the forefront of his mind. I listened with the others as he gave him the same story he told me on our journey, only interrupting a few times when he started to go on a tangent over one of his passions. Then, I found Dorian and he told me about what happened to the world and now we're here. Treat and Shen were the same look of sympathy I had when he first told me. It wasn't exactly the happiest of backgrounds, but Xavier told it with a smile. Treat leaned forward and rustled the bat's head fur. You're a brave guy, Xavier. There's a few things I have questions about, but I'll leave most of those for later. What I really want to know is how old you are. I'm turning 22, turning 23 this year. Hey, same as me then. Wow, really? But you're so built. A decade of working out will do that to you, bud. If you're looking to help build more muscle, I can give you some tips. As the two began to talk about improving their bodies, Shen and I shook our heads and mumbled simultaneously. Youngins. We made eye contact and appraised each other. 25 going on 26. 24 as of this year. The age difference was smaller, but the years I could see behind their eyes gave me a respect that they had aged beyond their physicality. Just what was their story? A question popped into my head to ask the group that might just help me learn more about the hyena. All right, I've got something for everyone to answer. They all looked at me expectantly. What's your motivation? Things are tough in this world right now, especially with us being kidnapped, but none of us have given up yet. For me, I want to find my boyfriend and the love of my life, Marshall. I finished speaking, and a feeling welled up in my chest. My quest to find Marshall is what I've dedicated myself to, but I began to realize that it's no longer the only thing keeping me going anymore. After leaving Haven to search for him, I think I was also trying to look for more purpose. I wanted to help people like so many had risked their necks to help me. Like how Marshall reached out when we first met. Though I didn't say it out loud, I thought to myself the other motivation I developed in that period. I want to protect Xavier. I'm not sure I really have a solid one yet, but I think the thing that I want the answer to most is what happened to my parents. They weren't the greatest at times, 
but they're still two of the people I love most. I smiled at the bat, taking my turn to rustle his head fur as he let out a few delighted bat noises from it. I want to find my sister. We got separated a while ago, and I made some mistakes that led to, well, this. He gestured to everything around us. I need to know that she's okay. Seems like all of us are looking for loved ones, then. Guess so. What about you, Shen? What keeps you going? They laughed. Easy. <laughs> it's spite. Spite? Yep. This world is a shit show. And what better way for me to tell it fuck you than to keep living and move forward despite that? I live my life as one big middle finger to existence. It was a different response than what I was expecting, but completely on brand for them. If it helped them move forward, then I wasn't going to judge. I can respect that. Same hair. It's a good role to live by. It's very freeing. Helps me justify quite a few questionable actions. Like what? Sleeping with our captors, for one. No, I haven't questioned that once. Hate fucking is an invigorating feeling. I'm afraid to know what you do, question. Oh, the usual existence. Sealing candies from babies. Trees. Trees? Yeah, trees. Why do you question trees? Because you can never trust a tree. Those things are evil. Trees are evil to you? I don't get why this is so hard to understand. What has a tree ever done for you? Plenty of kids each year get injured climbing them. If one falls, it can destroy a house. Not to mention if it falls in the woods, we can't be sure if it makes sound. All of us were speechless at this. I couldn't think of a single way to argue against such an out there statement. Speaking of traitors, where'd that raccoon go? I need to give him back his stick that's imbued with the power of superstition. We looked around the room, trying to find the reluctant helper, but unable to identify him amongst the small crowd. Ah, guys, I found him. We turned to the bat who pointed out the window, where we all saw the raccoon being wrapped up by a spider like faded. Looking away before a sickening crunch sounded and the crowd cheered. It was a grim reminder of our current circumstances. We backed away from the window and exchanged glances, Shen pocketing the stick with a sigh. None of us wanted to be here. Almost like our thoughts were being read, there was a commotion by the entrance we had all been brought in through as the guards prepared to send the, the next contestant. Will you just go and get them already? I'm only following orders. I paused listening to the voice. It was a woman speaking and she sounded familiar. And you expect me to believe you can handle it alone? It's two injured people compared to one healthy person. I can handle it. But I don't know. It's still a variable. I can prove to you just how capable I am against two opponents. You and your buddy there already look like you got your shit rocked. I'd say that'd be an even to who I'm escorting. Dude, just let her go. But I'm not getting punched again. The first man it let out a sigh. Fine. He cleared his throat before calling out to the crowd, not even bothering to look for whomever he needed. 
Dorian and Xavier, your escort to see the nurse is here. I blinked, surprised that we were actually being taken to be treated properly. I figured we'd have to wait until the end of Wonderland to be able to see her. Xavier beamed and slowly stood up, clearly excited to be getting out of here, but still cautious of his wounds. I followed suit and looked at our two new friends. Before I could get a word off, Treat pulled the two of us into a hug. We'll see you guys later, all right? Make sure to rest up, and you'll be back to peak condition in no time. Thanks, and if we're not back in time to see your fights, then just know we're rooting for you. The Wolverine gave a laugh. No need to worry about that. Wonderland is going to be lasting three days this time. You two already made a splash today, so they'll probably spread its returning contenders out to keep it interesting. The thought of having to sit through two more days like today sounded like actual hell. As we turned to leave, we raised our arms to wave as they did the same and caused Treat's shirt to rise up and expose some of his midriff. If my eyes hadn't drifted there, I doubt I would have noticed that there was a small but noticeable mark on the left side of his torso. A burn scar. My mind began to spin as we turned and walked to where our escort was waiting. The sight of her distracted me immediately before I could give it much thought. Standing at the entrance was a tall but muscular woman. A bandana covering her muzzle, she was a German shepherd as evidenced by her color scheme and other canine features. She wore an aqua blue sleeveless top, showing off the definition in her arms and the dragonfly tattoo that curled its way up her right bicep. To match, she wore black jeans with a belt while a dangling gold and blue earring hung from each ear. I tripped over my own feet trying to get myself stable as we approached her. What was she doing here? She laughed at my stumble and turned to the guards. See what I mean. Hardly a threat. Sir reached a hand to his cheek and patted him a few times. Now how about you be a good boy and bind their arms as an apology for the hassle you just put me through for a simple request, hmm? You wouldn't want Alistair to find out you've disobeyed him now, would you? The bandit grumbled to himself as he bound our hands in front of us, handing the leads to our escort. Perfect! That'll be all, sweetheart. With that, she turned and led us out of the room towards our destination. We walked in silence as we were led through the passage that brought us here and back to the other building, only to be led into another secret passage in that lower level. I wasn't sure where it led, but that wasn't the biggest thing on my mind right now. I continued to play quiet and follow until there was a time we could talk without the risk of being overheard. We were brought out of the tunnel and into another storage building, confirming my earlier theory that there being more than just one building. She nodded to the other bandits as we passed, taking us up a floor to where more of the office-like rooms were located. There were very few others here. Most had taken off to watch or help out with Wonderland. The bandit leading us stopped, listening intently and glancing in both directions, quickly and without warning. She'd ushered us into a room and closed the door with a loud sigh. Fucking hell, that was stressful. I'm impressed with myself that I'd managed to get this far. But this is an entire step up. Go on, you can applaud me now. Xavier was looking at her utterly confused while all I could do was stare in shock. 
Holy shit, it really is you. In the flesh, D. Bring it in. The German shepherd wrapped me in a tight hug. I tried to return it, but was unable to due to my bindings. I let out a grunt of pain as she squeezed my unintended injuries with all her strength. Quickly, the canine drew back. Right, sorry, sorry. Got carried away with the moment there. Let me take care of those. She started to remove our restraints, prompting Xavier to speak up. Dorian, why do you seem to know so many of these bandits? Is there something you're not telling me? This drew a laugh from her. I like this twink already. He and Oliver would get along well, I think. Aside from the questionable fashion choices, that is. You really do know how to find them, Dee. Xavier muttered something under his breath. Why does everyone keep calling me a twink today? I watched as the gears in his head clicked into place with a start. Wait, are you from Haven? She beamed at him, lowering the bandana from her muzzle. Smart, too. He got it with next to no context. The name's Thea, Bat Boy. Thea extended a hand, gripping Xavier's heart as she gave it a firm shake. Xavier. A strong name. I like it. No wonder you did so well in your fight. The brutality at the end was a bit overkill, but admittedly, I do the same in your shoes. I stepped forward, bringing the shepherd's attention back to me. Look, Thea, I'm excited to see you here, probably more than you know, but I don't understand. Why are you here? How are you here? She stared at me her face mirroring the confusion I had been feeling since I first saw her here. You mean Raya didn't tell you? Tell me what? She rubbed her forehead, seeming to gather her thoughts. God damn it, Raya! You owe me for this! She took a deep breath. A few months ago, Raya approached me and asked for my help. They learned about the existence of this bandit group and heard whispers of what they were up to. <clears throat> they were concerned about what was going on, and after some discussion, they thought the best way to stay safe and learn more was to put a man on the inside. Or in this case, a woman. She put on a satisfied smirk at that. She knew they could trust me to get the job done. As, as such, I figured, hey, what's more, one more burn scar anyway, and accepted the offer. She told me it was a secret mission and that I couldn't tell anybody. So naturally, I told Oliver the second she left. He didn't want me to go, but knew that I was more than capable for the job. After a makeover to help me look the part, about two weeks later, I left on my mission and infiltrated what we now know is called the Ignited. Kind of tacky name, if you ask me. I was reeling over this new info, questioning why Raya had hidden something so big from me. It also explained why I hadn't been able to say goodbye to her by the time I left Haven. She was already spying here for them. After I had built up enough trust... I was able to get messages out by going on night patrols and leaving notes at designated location. In exchange, they left some for me as well. Sorry I couldn't have been there when you left, by the way. You'll have to tell me all about what happened while you were away. But anyway, as more people were kidnapped, I learned just what Wonderland was and how close they were to running another one. I sent an emergency message to Haven and haven't heard back since. Then you two arrived. The pieces all began to fall into place. The message from Haven hadn't been sent with the news of Marshall, but to warn me of the bandit group led by my ex. 
Haven was on lockdown because they couldn't risk more people getting kidnapped, and we were kidnapped in order to start Wonderland. It had all been a series of unfortunate coincidences. Thea continued. I was planning to leave at the end of this edition with either that Wolverine hunk or my fellow trans hyena, but now that you two are here, I can take one of you instead. The two of us were silent for a moment before Xavier spoke what we were both thinking. Only one of us? She sighed. More than that poses a big risk. This wouldn't be the first case of an escaped attempt. It'd mean I'd be locked up like you two if we fail and leave Haven down. Not to brag or anything, but an important part of its leadership. She turned to look at me. Which is why I'd like to extend the opportunity to take you with me, Dorian. I blanched. Wait, what? With your help, there's no doubt we can organize an assault on this place. If we do enough damage to their inventory, rescue their prisoners, maybe fuck with some of the lion dickhead's personal supplies, it could cause an internal conflict. It might just be enough to get them to disband even. So what do you say? I barely even thought about it before the word left my mouth. No. No? I shook my head, catching Xavier's surprised reaction in the corner of my eye. As much as I'd like to do that, Thea, I can't. My conscience wouldn't allow me to accept getting out while others are trapped here. The duo stared at me, likely confused as to why I wasn't taking the opportunity to escape. Isn't this what I had wanted? A chance to get out and continue searching for Marshall? Which is why you need to take Xavier instead. Whoa, hold on. Why me? I don't even know anyone from Haven. Your connections there would be much more influential and you'd accomplish a lot more. Because I know what you've been through. And I know that the last thing you want is to be trapped again. That shifted uncomfortably. Our whole kidnapping was never supposed to happen. And you deserve the chance to be able to live a life not trapped in one place. You've had your share of burdens recently, Xavier. Allow me to give you this break, please. He was silent for a moment before wiping a tear and smiling at me. Thanks, Dorian. The bat then threw himself into a tight hug around me. Anytime, kid. We stood there in our embrace for a short while until Thea cleared her throat ending the moment. I couldn't help but feel a heat rise to my cheeks. Thea eyed me suspiciously before continuing. Well then, Xavier, looks like you'll be getting to see Oliver sooner than I thought. God, how I miss his wit right now. I'm sure he misses you all the same. Did your lovely twin give you some acting tips before you left? Because you were quite convincing. Nope, that was all me, Dee. It's easy to blend in when nobody is willing to challenge you. She flexed. Guns of steel and a boisterous personality can take you a long way, boys. Keep working towards it and maybe someday you two can be like me. A sassy blacksmith? Damn right! I know that without this apocalypse, I would have been the next worldwide icon little girls dreamed about. I smiled mischievously. Or had nightmares about. She glared. Careful, Dorian. I can still bench press your ass up and over the side of a building. I raised my hands in defeat, causing her to smile. As much as I'd love to catch up more... We need to get the two of you to Nadia's office. If we waste any more time, they'll know something is up. Thria grabbed the rope and gestured to put our hands up so she could rebind them. 
Since I am going to be taking the bat here with me, though, I'd appreciate it if you could get us some help, Dorian. What do you mean? Even though Wonderland will be over and the bandits will be partying to celebrate, it would help if you could get distractions going. The less guards roaming the halls, the better. If you can manage a way to distract Alistair, too, that would be perfect. He's their boss for a reason, and that reason being he packs some serious firepower. I nodded, my curiosity peeking at what the lion had that could tame so many people. Thea turned her gaze to Xavier. Lastly, find a way to get yourself to the nurse's office for the final night. It's the easiest point of extraction for me to get the both of us out of here. You both get all that. Loud and clear. Excellent. She placed an ear to the door, listening for a few moments before pulling the bandana back over her muzzle. All right, you two. Back to being miserable. It's time to take action. With that, our spy flung the door open and brought us back into the hallway and towards our destination. It wasn't much further of a walk where Thea had taken us aside to be able to reach the nurse's office. It was an average-sized room, with proper beds spread out across it. I wasn't sure where they'd managed to find them, but I considered myself lucky they did. The room was empty save for the person we were looking for tucked into a desk at the back corner of the room. Nadia, I believe Thea had called her earlier, was an older cheetah woman, a pair of small glasses sitting on the bridge of her nose. She was thin, almost frail looking, wearing a dark thin woolen turtleneck tucked up into a pair of plain tan slacks. She brought her eyes up to us as we approached. Took you long enough. I thought it was clear patients were to be brought directly to me after their fights. I'm sorry, Nadia. I tried... No. That is Dr. Adebio to you. I may not have received my doctorate, but I have more than earned it. Right. Apologies, Dr. Adebio. As I was saying, the other bandits there weren't letting them leave, so I had to take it up with Alistair. She shook her head. Of course they did. Most of you seem to have nothing but half-baked ideas of how to make others suffer in those empty heads of yours. Nadia looked back down as Thea sighed, knowing she wasn't going to make any progress with the cheetah. The three of us stood there waiting awkwardly before her gaze returned to us. Well, what are you waiting for? Both of you take a seat. You are no longer needed here, girl. I could see the anger burning in Thea's eyes, ready to spill over. I nudged her with my foot to get her back to composing herself. She glared at me before her expression softened. Thea untied our leads and walked to the exit, spraying one last glance at us and lowering the bandana to her mouth for two words. Good luck. I nodded in understanding, and then she was gone. Xavier and I sat across from each other for a moment, unsure of what to do as the silence stretched on. After a moment, Andia stood from behind her desk with a first aid kit in hand, and moved towards us to begin whatever treatment she had planned. Now, which one of you will be first? Her eyes darted to me and then Xavier, stopping with recognition of the bat. 
Ah, I see you have fought on the first day. Quite unfortunate. Well, can't say my luck has been too great recently. So this was about par for the course. He started to laugh, but cringed in pain from his abdominal wound. Nadia's eyes lit up in concern as she finally noticed it. That decides it. We are treating you first. Remove the shirt so I may properly look at your wounds. But what about... He will be fine. He's injured too. He will be fine. Dressing an open wound like this is what matters more at the moment. Xavier looked like he wanted to say more, but she shushed him. Talking will only make him wait longer. Be silent. The bat looked at me helplessly, but all I could do was shrug. I wanted Xavier treated first anyway, so this was the best outcome. The comment she had made earlier clearly had ground to stand on as she began her treatment. Her hands were quick and efficient. First she had taken a bucket with warm water that had been prepared from before we arrived and began gently dabbing at the area around the wound. Once the dried blood from both Xavier and the faded had been cleared, she grabbed a clean cloth and some strong smelling disinfectant to gingerly apply to the wound. Xavier sucked in a sharp breath and grunted, the sting from the fluid causing him pain. Poor kid. Taking a roll of bandages, she tightly bound his abdomen in the gauze and tied it off, securing it in place with a bobby pin. Done. You were lucky the wound was not deep. Otherwise, you would have needed stitches and months of bed rest. Do not overdo it, or the wound will reopen. Are there any other injuries you sustained that I should look at? Well, I had my shoulder dislocated, but a friend of ours popped it back in. Oh. She moved to his shoulder, applying pressure to the area to check it. It is well done. I presume the Wolverine did this. Yep. Ah, that boy knows his stuff. I wanted to make him my assistant, but he would not budge in his own goals. The lion also denied the request. That's too bad. Do things tend to get busy around here? Not really. Only when this damnable tournament rolls around. Otherwise... It is these fools coming to me for minor aches and pains. I have treated children with stronger pain capacities. Nadia smiled to herself. Sometimes I like to tell them absurd things they must do in order to feel better or send them on fetch quests. They never even question it due to my accent. That is how I know that they are nothing but idiots. Xavier returned the smile and shot me a wink. He really did have a natural charm in dealing with people. Either right way, I'm glad you're here to help people like us. How did you end up here, anyway? Her face darkened, and she shifted her attention to Xavier's hand. Raising it, she began to undo the bandaging in order to rebind it. I was tricked by someone I had known long ago. He wanted my help, and I thought it would be for a good cause, but I was wrong. I am nothing more than a prisoner like you now, just with a little more freedom. As she finished with Xavier's hand, she held onto it for a moment, gently rubbing the back of it with her thumb. You are a kind soul, young bat. Let it guide you and provide hope for those that can no longer feel it. Be the light for those in the dark. Xavier nodded, a sullen look on his face. I can try. 
She reached up and patted his cheek, a soft smile lingering with sadness in her eyes. And that shall be good enough. She drew her hands away from him and brought her attention properly to myself, that look of neutrality back on her face. Your turn. What injuries did you sustain? I was hit in my right thigh, left wrist, and on the back by these flesh-eating blob monstrosities, as well as slashed across the forehead by some claws on my right side. I was then thrown violently against a wall backwards and bludgeoned in the back of the head by one of the guards. Why did they bludgeon you? Xavier chimed in. He wanted to fight in my place. She shook her head. I will treat you, but if you continue to have a disregard for your own life, you will not receive this same aid. I understand. Good. Now remove your clothes so I can get started. A few hours later, I laid back in one of the makeshift hospital beds and stared up at the ceiling. Like Xavier, I had been lucky my wounds weren't deep and hadn't required stitching. The bleeding had stopped amongst all of them, and I would likely heal quickly. Unfortunately, my head hadn't been so lucky. The trauma from the bandit and the wall impact had left me to nurse a minor concussion for the next week or so. A bandit had dropped by some time after to send a report back to Alistair and Nadia informed them that we would be spending the night here for further observation. He tried to object to that, but she quickly shut him down and sent him on his way. It was clear by now the first day of Wonderland had finished, but rather than feel any sort of release on that fact, I felt nothing but anxious and sad. Nobody else had been brought to the office today. Meaning Xavier and I were the only two survivors. Not only that, it left only two days for me to form and coordinate an escape plan for Thea and Xavier. It was all a lot to handle. I stared across the room to look at the bat, sleeping soundly in his cot. I'm sure he was glad to not have to sleep alone in a dark space again. Meanwhile, Nadia sat at her desk in the corner reading a small book. I couldn't make out the title, but the cover was worn from reuse. I had a time limit to all this, and I couldn't waste any more. We'd be taken out of here come morning, and that left a few chances to try and convince her to help us with our plan. It was now or never, but I should at least try to play things smoothly with her like Xavier had. Maybe she would also warm up to me. So, Nadia, what? No. She didn't look up from her book. No. I did not give you the right to address me by my first name. If you are going to talk to me, call me Dr. Adavio. I cringed internally chastising myself for slipping up already after remembering the earlier. Right. Apologies, Dr. Adibio. All I was going to ask was what book you were reading. No response. What is it called? She flipped the page. And why do you want to know? I'm sorry? What does it matter to you what book I am reading? There is nothing to be gained from such simple conversation. What about me makes you think I am a woman who cares for vapid and empty pleasantries? I quieted, unsure what to say. 
I think it is clear to the both of us that there is something on your mind you want to talk about that you have deemed important enough to interrupt my reading. So. She paused, finishing the page she was on and sliding a bookmark in it to look at me in the eyes. Speak your piece or hold it so I may go back to enjoying what limited free time I have of my own. Well, no time like the present. We need your help with something. A plan that we only need you to play a small role in. It's simple, really. All you need? No. But I didn't even finish what I was saying. Yet my answer remains the same. Can I at least... No. Because I already know what you're going to say. And what's that? The edge of frustration was creeping into my voice at her dismissive attitude toward my pleas for help. Do not raise your voice to me, boy. You are an easy to read as my book. She dropped it on her desk for emphasis with a thump, standing up and walking over to where I sat. You plan to try to escape this place, to take your friend and flee, but it will not work. You are not the first to try, and you certainly will not be the last to fail. We have someone on the inside, though. That bandit who brought us here earlier, she's been spying for months and can help get at least one person out. She laughs. If she is your spy, then your chances are even lower. Nothing about that girl has been subtle since the day she arrived. She would also not be the first to turn her back on our captors. And what happened to the last one? I believe you have already met him. After all, he helped your friend there earlier. My mind flashed to the burn scar I'd seen on Treat's midriff earlier. So he had been one of the bandits, and was caught trying to escape, resulting in his imprisonment. But why had he joined in the first place? I couldn't make sense of it. Even still, Thea wouldn't be trying this if she didn't have a plan. At the end of Wonderland, the bandits will be all too busy celebrating to put up a proper guard. How do you know this? Because that's what she told me, and I trust her wholeheartedly. And how does she know this? I assume it's because she's been learning about them. She's able to guess what will happen. You are saying these words but you do not hear the problems amongst them. I scoffed in annoyance. What problems? Guess and assume. Neither of these mean that you truly know. You and her are doing nothing but making predictions that will only make things worse. If you want a chance to leave this place, you need certainties. I've refused to help with a plan based on nothing but luck. It's not luck, it's... It is what? There is no stable foundation to your words. If you'd let me explain... There is nothing to explain that you have not already said. I have entertained your foolishness long enough. She turned her back to me, and the patience I'd been holding on to broke. Just fucking listen. No. She whipped back down, leaning down and pointing a finger in my face. You, listen to my words, and listen closely. Everything I have heard of you, from your actions today, and what Xavier told me when he was here yesterday have told me everything I need to know. You are careless and brash. 
leading the way without giving anything proper thought or stopping to consider how to act. You choose to live in the moment with little thought of the future. Your urge to escape this place is one we all share, yet you still focus on yourself and how this can benefit you. You cannot go through with this, because this is yet again you throwing your life into the wind. In a perfect world, where we all make it out of here, what happens when you and the bats are out together and encounter danger? You will continue that reckless and endanger him with yourself? If that time comes, he will throw himself in the way to protect you. That boy admires and cares for you more than you know. He is compassionate, considerate, caring, and a bright hope for the future we all want to see. But if he puts himself in the way of harm like that, injuring himself from your actions and resulting in what could be his death, he is not the one to blame for caring too much. Your actions affect more than just yourself, and you seem to forget that. Should his light go out, the future only grow dimmer. His blood will be on your hands, and your hands alone. Act smarter and do better, or we will all suffer. With that, she stood back up, looking down on me in distaste. Do you understand? Not able to find my voice, I simply nodded at her words. She took that for her answer and sat back at her desk, picking up where she left off in her book. She was right. Every word that had left her mouth had hit home and I knew there was nothing I could do at that moment to change her mind. If we were going to survive this, if all of us were going to make it out alive, we'd have to exercise the utmost caution. I'd have to do better and think harder than I had been. This wasn't some game where I could simply set a checkpoint to restart at. There were consequences to my actions that could not be undone that I had to weigh properly. I looked back at the sleeping bat, my chest filled with worry over his future. If I could help him bring about that future Nadia had imagined, then that's what I had to do. Tomorrow would be a new day, a day of planning and preparations for what would hopefully be a successful escape. Rather than extinguish the flame for my desire to escape, that just speech had fanned it further. I would give it my all to make my guarantees and account for possibilities of what could go wrong, to make sure that things weren't left to luck. If I couldn't make enough, then we would call it off until the next best opportunity. I laid back in bed pulling up the covers and feeling the day's exhaustion begin to settle in. I needed to rest for what was to come. My future was in my hands, and I wasn't going to let it slip away. It wasn't often that I dreamed, but on the few occasions that I did, a faint memory playing behind my closed eyes as I drifted off to sleep was the most I ever really got. The most common thing for me was pure darkness, a simple void I existed in until I woke up the next day. That was how I was used to my nights going. Tonight was different. As I drifted off to sleep, I found myself in a gray space. The emptiness stretched on forever, seemingly infinite in scale. I stood there, unsure of what was happening when I felt something cold at my feet. On instinct, 
I took a step forward and realized I, that I was walking in a thin layer of fluid. I looked down on my feet to check, and I saw firsthand that my body had changed. It wasn't a physical change. I still had the same outline that I knew belonged to me. Rather, it appeared that I was made of static. I reached my arms up in disbelief, staring at the glitching, constantly shifting texture that was in their place. I moved one to touch the other, only to find that I wasn't able to feel anything but the cold liquid on the ground. I wasn't sure where I was or what had occurred, but I couldn't just stand there and wait for something to happen. Instead, I took a step forward, my feet silently making contact with the water below. As I walked, I tried to call out into the space, but was unable to use my voice. There was no sound here. Though a part of me wanted to freak out, there was something eerily calming to me about the entire experience. It was as though I was familiar with being here, yet I couldn't place why. Time seemed to become irrelevant as I strode forward through the nothingness, unsure how long I'd been walking for. After a while, I heard a noise in the distance. As I approached, the water at my feet seemed to be drawn towards it as well. In the floor some meters away was a round black hole that the water was rushing towards. I approached and tried to peer into it, but nothing was to be seen. The water vanished after curling around the lip. Watched it and waited for any kind of change, but none came. Instead, a command began to build in my head until it was all I could think about. Jump. So I took a step closer and jumped straight down into the hole. It was like I'd been submerged in water, the icy feeling in my feet spreading through my whole body as I floated. The noise from before, as well as the hole I jumped through, had vanished. Alone, I floated through nothingness, until I felt myself pulled forward at a rapid speed, my body hurtling towards its unknown destination with nothing I could do to stop myself. Then, just as sudden, I'd stopped. Before me now was a sphere of light, pulsing in the space, yet illuminating nothing. My body no longer responded to my efforts to move, the only thing cooperating being my eyes. As I took in the space around the orb, I realized I wasn't alone here. Three other static people floated around the spear with me. One was short and skinny, one tall and average. The third was noticeably smaller than the rest. They looked almost child-sized. The four of us hovered around the light, unmoving, as a voice sounded within our heads. The story has begun. The tale weaves before your eyes, even as you remain unaware. Everything now remains undecided. The path forward is not set, but shaped and molded by what's to come. The pieces are all in place, the roles set to embrace to enable your destinies. The false hero. The one meant to guide the chosen on their path, yet has strayed from their own. Trust in your experience. The hope. The one creating a course for our hero without realizing and giving them a chance against what has to come. Trust in yourself. The variable. The one whose role is not so defined. They are a piece in play that will change the story in ways that cannot be predicted. What they do could aid or hinder the path of our hero. Trust in your heart. 
the lost, the one who has let desire overcome them and turn them into a worse fate. So far gone are they, it is unclear whether they will ever find themselves again. There is no trust for you to find. The voice stopped, pausing for a moment before repeating itself. The false hero. Trust in your allies. The hope. Trust in yourself. The variable. Trust in your heart. The lost. There is no trust for you to find. Then it repeated again. And again. And again. After the fifth time, the light gave one final pulse before it seemingly exploded and consumed the space around us. Suddenly, images were flashing before my eyes. Ruined cities, churches, laboratories, empty fields, and overgrown buildings. There were too many too fast for me to process any of them. Yet a sense of recognition filled me as though I knew some of these places. As the images played, the sheer sensory overload of it all began to overtake me, and though I hadn't been breathing, it no longer feels like I can. Then in an instant, the void returned, and I remained paralyzed with the others before the light. Begin. I took one last look at the shapes as their voices said that, and then my body was sent rocketing back through the darkness and towards myself, back towards consciousness. To be continued. Okay. Okay. We're going all fantasy. Like, I thought that, I thought... I thought that he was going to, like, this is how, like, he become faded. I did not expect him to jump in the black hole because we know other people can become faded. I thought that was a whole thing about, like, this is how you become a faded. Everyone has this, like, hole in their body. And you're going to like, jump in it. And you're going to, like, okay, 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 okay. okay. We, we're, going on, we're going on a hero trip. So, any bets on what Dorian's going to be in that? Which one he is? Let me see. There was the false hero, the hope, the variable... And the lost. I mean, the easy outs to the false hero, but I think it would be so interesting. It would be a tragic story if he was the lost. And do we want to take a bet that it's like the other four? I don't know. We've gotten further away from like figuring out what's going on with Marshall and like if he's even alive. But man, okay, okay. Real talk, Nadia's. Favorite character. Hands down. Hands down. It's like, it, like, like there's so much like over the top tropes that happen. And then Nadia comes in and just sh shuts all of that down. I'm like, yes. Put some realism on this stuff. Someone who's like, I've seen it before. No. No. You don't know shit. You don't know. You can't know. Ah. Uh, I love Nadia. I love her so much. That that was That was great. That was great. Oh, man. Good job, team. And like I said, I know this has been late. I've been crazy busy living life and working and traveling and doing stuff. I know I haven't been able to do so much, but this was fun. Oh, man. Good job, team. Good job, team. Very nice, very nice, very nice. Ah. Uh. This has been Fritze Says, and have a nice day, everyone. Ciao.